Acts chapter 2, verse 36. I'd like to preach on the subject, Who is Lord? Acts 2, Acts 2 and verse 36. Would help if I got at least in the New Testament. Amen. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. The scripture says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The basic confession of Christians is that Jesus is Lord. But the question has to be asked, do we know what that means? And I fear that most people really don't understand what is meant by that. It's my desire as you leave here tonight that you will understand why we say Jesus is Lord. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, give us grace tonight to do what we cannot do in our own power. I pray that you'd bless this congregation. Give them hearing ears and understanding hearts. And may we glorify Christ. And may we understand where the things in this universe are headed toward. And bless us as we think about our Savior in whose name we ask it. Amen. Amen. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 25, we have the first five days of creation. And after each of these days, except one, it says, and God saw that it was good. Now, the details of creation are good. The Lord can do things that men cannot do. For instance, God created light. Light goes 186,000 miles per second. It can hit a plant, turn into sugar through photosynthesis. I mean, that's good. God can do all sorts of things. He can make it rain. He can carry the rain across the ocean in the cloud and just do wondrous things. But in Genesis 1, verse 26 through 31, we get the big picture. The first five days, those are just details. The Lord hasn't woven the details together yet that we might understand. But in Genesis 1 and verse 26, the scripture says, Genesis 1, excuse me, as brother... Dear brother, I used to know you used to say I'm having a Parkinson's moment. I wanted Genesis 1, verse 26 through 31. The scripture says, And God said, this is the sixth day, the creation of the sixth day, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and lo every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and over everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat and it was so and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God creates the 
details of this universe. He says it was good. But then he creates man, and he says, when it's all over, it was very good. The details of the first five days of creation are like the building of a manor. The manor has no meaning until the king of the manor or the prince of the manor moves in. And so in Genesis chapter 1, we find out that all these things that were good that God created are the property of man, and they were made for the use and made that man might be blessed. Now, he, God said, take dominion. Take dominion. What does that mean? It means that Adam is to learn what he has. In other words, to name something is to take dominion. And that, in Genesis 2, verse 19, Genesis 2, verse 19, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names unto all the cattle, unto the fowl of the air, unto the beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found to help meat for him. So Adam is to learn what he has. And as he names the animals and the plants, uh, the various things that God created. I think, for instance, a power that we use every day in our lives is electricity. Well, there's a lot to learn about electricity. I don't understand electricity. I'd probably get electrocuted if I fooled with it much. But you can make electric by the sun, the power of the sun, the power of moving water, the power of the wind, atomic power, fossil fuels. All those things can be made to use, uh, use electricity. I said that you can imagine if you wanted to watch TV and you couldn't make electricity and you had to have a kite with a key on it and every now and then the lightning would hit and the TV would come on a second. Well, we're to take dominion. And when you learn how to make electricity, that's what God means by dominion. He told him to name the animals. To name the plants and the animals means to describe them. To understand them uh, so that he can take advantage of the potential that is there. You take, for instance, plants. We take one plant in particular, corn. You can make sweet corn that tastes really good to eat. You can make field corn that dries in the field and becomes fodder for cattle. You can make popcorn, Indian corn for decorations, miniature corn. Uh, to pickle and use as an hors d'oeuvre. In other words, man, God has put a lot of potential. It's not obvious in things. Yeah. And to, for man to take dominion is for man to learn how to use those things for his benefit. Mm -hmm. We think of animals. You take the horse. You have little tiny horses that are raised for children to ride. You have powerful horses like a Pershon that is used to do heavy work. You have beautiful horses, fast horses, tall horses, short horses. In other words, God has given these things to man that he might learn the potential, the genetic potential. You take, for instance, if you want, you can make sugar out of corn. Uh, you can make sugar out of sugar cane. You can make sugar out of sugar beets. And so you want to take a beat and you want to raise that, so to speak, to where you have the most percentage of sugar in it. But you can only go so high because there's only so much potential in, for change in the, the sugar beet or any other plant. And so when we think of people like uh, George Washington Carver who worked with the peanut, Eli Whitney, Pasteur, men that figured out how to cure diseases, Henry Ford, and transportation, Edison, he invented all sorts of things, Muhammad Ali, the great athlete. All of these men had their ability from Adam. 
All of these men, we might say, are the wreck of an Adam after the fall. But you see what tremendous ability Adam had that he could do these things. And to a limited degree, man is still doing these things today. And so we were to learn what we have. And man is continuing to learn and to perfect that. And then Adam needed to learn what he didn't have. In Genesis 2 and verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And then it says that Adam said about the woman in verse 23, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Now, it's interesting. If you were to learn about corn, you know, first time I ever raised corn, somebody had to explain some things to me and show me some things. And if you're going to learn about corn, you have to know something. If you're going to breed animals and look for a particular result, you have to know something. And men, you better know something about your wife. 1 Peter 3, 7 says to dwell with them according to knowledge. And you don't dwell with your wife according to knowledge and you're liable to be in the court making payments. (laughs) How wonderful it is that God has made a help meet for us. Maybe you've heard this before. I love... Milton in Paradise Lost, he said this about the woman. Under his forming hands a creature grew, man-like but different sex. So lovely fair that what seemed fair in all the world seemed now mean or in her summed up, in her contained. And in her looks, which from that time infused sweetness into my heart unfelt before, and into all things from her air inspired the spirit of love and amorous delight. On she came, led by her heavenly maker, though unseen, and guided by his voice, nor uninformed of nuptial sanctity and marriage rites. Grace was in her step, heaven in her eye, and every gesture, dignity, and love. I believe God brought out the horse, and Adam said, what a neat animal. I ride that thing all day. And the dog came out and licked him in the face, and he said, what a companion. And Eve came out and he said, get that junk away from me. <laughs> and I believe he said, Lord, this is a wonderful idea. Amen. It was a wonderful idea. And God gives us what we need. I remember when I was just married and we had our first baby. It's funny how God makes a difference in men and women and how he makes them to compliment each other. Can you imagine a world with just men? Well, you couldn't have it because nobody would (laughs) survive to manhood. Uh, I remember when we were just married and my wife had a girl and she was sick. She had to stay in the hospital. Well, the insurance company wouldn't let uh, the baby stay in the hospital. The baby was well. And so the they had to send the baby home with me. Well, those nurses were scared to death. <laughs> and, you know, I have a dry sense of humor. They were worried, and they said, well, what, do you know what to feed the baby? I said, well, hot dogs and stuff. <laughs> and, and, you know, they just got quite excited. And it was kind of, <laughs> kind of funny. That Sunday morning, I lived in a married dorm of a college. And you think I was short of hell? No, you know, women like babies. I don't know if you knew that. But I thought about renting it out. (laughs) Turning a profit on the deal. But 
God knew what we needed. Amen. And the woman needs the man, and the man needs the woman, and both the, the, the family needs the mother, and how wonderful and good God is. But Adam had to learn that he needed something. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people today that need something, and they don't seem to know what it is. It's our job to tell them. So Adam was Lord. You see that. God created the universe, nature, the genetic possibilities. All those things were made to be a blessing to Adam. And he was to learn how to use those things. So Satan, or rather Adam was Lord. But our second point is that Satan wanted to be Lord. Satan came in and he tempted man. And when he tempted man, man fell. And you know, Satan was smart. How did he tempt man? Through Eve. And you know, he'd already happened to get on Adam because Adam was supposed to work till five and he kept coming home at three to see Eve. And so... Adam was tempted and he fell. And in Genesis 3, verse 16 through 19, we see what happened. It says, Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. So you see, God speaks to the woman. He said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And so the woman has depression. We, we speak today of, of uh, women having depression with childbirth. And then he speaks to Adam. He said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles, uh, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. You see, he, he named her. Now, Satan, in his craft, used the great love that Adam had for Eve to bring about the fall of of Adam, and when that occurred, Adam was no longer able to completely learn what he had, and uh, he, work became unpleasant, it became hard, and by the sweat of his face, he was able to make a living because he had lost the ability to really take dominion. Now, I want to ask a question Why did Satan hate man? so badly that he would tempt man and bring about his fall? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, Satan was covetous of the dominion that God had given to man. Satan wanted to be the one taking dominion. He wanted to be the one calling the shots. Another reason is because man is lower than the angels. In Psalm 8, the Bible says man was made a little lower than the angels. And Satan, you know, he's thinking, Adam's only got an IQ of 150, I got an IQ of 200. Why does he get to take dominion? I ought to have that job. Man made a little lower than the angels. And the angelic work, Ephesians 1 and verse 14 says about the angels, are they not ministering spirits? sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. And so, God tells the devil, it's your job to be a blessing to man and to help man. And Satan, he is furious about this idea. Then also, when Christ came into the world and took an alternate form, the Bible says he lay not hold of the seed of Abraham, but he but he, or he lay not hold of angels, but he lay hold of the seed of Abraham. In other words, he took upon 
him human nature. And this infuriated the devil. Satan went on to do more than this. You, you take, for instance, if you go into a country and you destroy the leader, you create a power vacuum. And what is, happens, other men run in and try to fill that vacuum. Well, when Satan caused Adam to fall, there was a vacuum left, and Satan rushed in, and he took that position. Mm -hmm. He is now what? The God of this world. Amen. The prince of the power of the air. Yeah. And so, Satan replicates his character in men. In John 8, verse 44, Jesus said, You're of your father the devil, and his works you will do. And men are liars, and they're murderers, just like Satan. It's important to understand those things. In Daniel 7 and 8, we talk about the nations. And what does the Bible compare the nations to? Ferocious beast. And nations, the nations of this world since the fall are just that. They're ferocious beasts. We have two portions of Scripture that are especially interesting to me. The first one is Isaiah 14 and it's talking about the king of Babylon. But as you read it, it becomes obvious that it's not just the king of Babylon that it's talking about Satan. And I think the real interpretation of that portion of scripture is that uh, God caused the, the characteristics of the devil to be seen in human leaders. In Isaiah 14 and verse 12, the scripture says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? If you keep reading and you read the part before that, you see that it's talking about the king of Babylon. But it's not just talking about the king of Babylon. It's talking about the king of Babylon who will be like Satan. It says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the earth. I will ascend above the cloud, the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And so you see that the same sin that caused Satan to fall is replicated in human leaders. Yeah. We see the same thing in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 and verse 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and send him. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And then verse 14, he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Now, when were these things true of the prince of Tyre? But they were true in a sense, because when he sinned, his character became like the devil. And so the Lord speaks to him in that way. And so Adam was Lord. Satan wanted to be Lord. But here's the good news. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Now, let me explain something. I'm going to use a couple big words here. And I'm going to tell you what they mean. And, uh, because I want you to understand what is meant by Jesus is Lord. Ontological. The word ontological means according to the natural order of things. In other words, this is obviously the way it is. Now... Is God the Father Lord? Is God the Son Lord? Is God the Holy Spirit Lord? Well, let me tell you, God the Father has all power. Amen. He knows all things. Amen. He could crush this universe like a peanut. If you have that much power, you are Lord. Amen. That's Amen. according to the nature of things. Same thing could be said of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Same thing could be said 
of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus has a special lordship. That God has made this same Jesus whom he crucified, both Lord and Christ. His lordship is called a mediatorial lordship. It was not given to him because he was God. It was given to him because he became a man. It was not given to him because of his greatness, but his humility in uh, being crucified. Listen to this portion of scripture. This is out of Philippians Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. Notice. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, be humble like Christ was. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. To say that Jesus was in the form of God means that everything that makes God who He is was true of Jesus. Amen. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made Himself of no reputation, and took upon Him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all have ontological lordship, but Jesus Christ is given a mediatorial lordship because he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Yeah. Because he did that, the Father said, I've given you a name above every name. Amen. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Because he was the sufferer. In John 5, 27, it says that Jesus is the judge. And why? Because he was the Son of Man. Amen. And Daniel 7, if I can find that quickly. Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Notice, it didn't say the Son of God. The Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And, there was given to him, and, and they brought him near before him, and there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And so Jesus is Lord not because he is God but because he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. And Jesus is Lord. Kings need to learn that. Rulers need to learn that. That, that Jesus is Lord. Listen to what the scripture says about the mediatorial reign of Jesus Christ. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that setteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sword of his pleasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And then he says, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Now, here's the thing I want you to notice. That in this lordship that Christ has, it both involves judgment and salvation. Amen. He says that he, he that sits in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord is going to have the rulers of this world in derision. The Lord's going to laugh at them. And he'll break their bands asunder. 
He'll dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And he says, you better be wise to the rules of the earth. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when the wrath is kindled but a little. And so there's two ways that you can confess Christ. You can do it at the last day when, because you haven't received Christ as Savior, God judges you. Or you can do it by coming to Christ and trusting in Him and saying in the Lord, have we righteousness and strength? I think of another portion of Scripture. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. This Scripture is quoted from the Old Testament and the New Testament more than any other. And notice how these two things are found in it. Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, and the beauties of holiness before the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now, the thing I want you to notice is that there's two ways to confess Christ. You can do it as you look to Him as, for, as Savior, or you can do it as you look to Him as that enemy that has all power. Now, just a few words and then we'll be through. People love to preach and say, make Jesus Lord. Now, that, that is silly. I'm a resident of Boone County, but I don't make the sheriff of Boone County sheriff. If I rob a bank, I don't make him sheriff. If he catches me, I'll probably confess that he is the sheriff. Jesus is Lord. We cannot make him Lord. The Father has made him Lord. But we must confess him as Lord. You can do this again in two ways. You can do it, what is Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Amen. Lord. Amen. In Acts 16, verse 31, Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. and thou shalt be saved. You know, we have a, had a debate in this country, in religious circles, about whether or not you could be saved without taking Jesus as Lord. I don't, I don't know what universe people are living in. What part of call upon the name of the Lord do you not understand? We do not make Jesus Lord, but we confess Him as Lord. And you can confess Him tonight, and you'll be blessed through all eternity. But you wait till later. And he'll smite you with a rod of iron. You can do it now. And he'll say thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. But if you don't do it now. You'll meet not Jesus the lamb. But Jesus. The Jesus. The soldier. Jesus the, the soldier. Amen.